好，欢迎大家来到由 CG 体验与央视联合做的国际多样生物多样性质直播间。Hi everyone, welcome to our special program for the International Day for Biological Diversity from 10:30 to 6 p.m. Today we will show you a lot of wonderful facts about our animals. About 200 million years ago. The whole planet of Earth was surrounded by the water, and later on, there's the plate movement and separation, and we start to have to seven different continents. Today, we're about to connect once again the seven continents, and together we can have a view about the beauty of the biological diversity. And today, I'm not in a normal studio, and I believe that many of you must have. Be like me, being obliged to stay at home, and we cannot enjoy our holidays out. But it's okay because today I will travel together with you with our science and technology, our、uh, communication technologies. I'm about to show you the live pictures in the different national parks and natural reserves from the different continents of the world. Actually. What are these continents? Some of you must have already learned about that in the textbooks during the primary school learning days. If you know the answer about the names of all the seven continents, please don't hesitate to leave us a message on the platform. At the same time, I can also give you the names: Asia, Europe, Africa, Oceania. South Africa, North Africa, and the Antarctic continent. And days ago, when I talked about the seven continents with my friends, some even mentioned the North Pole. But the North Pole is not a continent. We only have the Antarctica. And today, before our live streaming program, we have initiated a voting on our online platforms. We'd like to know which continents or which continent you would like to check out online first. And now, for our viewers online, please don't hesitate to tell me your answer. I'd like to know. Which is the most popular continent among all your guys? And today, we of course we are holding this program for the celebration of International Day for Biological Diversity. Biodiversity is not only important for the nature, for the animals, but also it's important for human society. Because imagine for the whole chain of the biodiversity, we cannot afford to lose any part of it. If any part of the chain is broken, then all the lives on this planet will be lost. And for the symbolic animals, when we talk about Asia, we will usually come up with the idea of the giant panda. And when we talk about Africa, then many people will start to talk about the giraffes. So now I also would like to know your favorite animals. What's your favorite animal? Panda. I think they're very cute. I always would like to visit Sichuan Province to see the great pandas. Okay, as is mentioned by Sui Wenjing. She would like to visit the province of Sichuan to see the giant panda. Usually, when we talk about the giant panda, we directly would mention the name of the province Sichuan. However, we have often ignored another important place for the living of the giant panda, that is the Qingling of Shanxi Province. Actually, due to some historical reasons of the natural. 
throughout evolution, there were two subspecies of the giant panda. One subspecies is living now in the Sichuan province, another is in the Qingling area of the Shanxi province. Days ago, we have had the chance to take a video clip in the Qingling area. Dear viewers, please have a guess. What am I holding now in my uh, in my hands? I'm now standing inside the Qingling Natural Reserve. I'm now surrounded by some experts for the protection of the giant pandas. We have made some short walk inside this natural reserve for the protection of the giant pandas. And now we have already discovered one piece of feces of the giant panda. I think that is a very fresh piece of the panda feces. You can try to smell it. <laughs> How does it smell? So, dear viewers, to tell the truth, actually, the smell of the feces of the giant panda is exactly the same smell of the fresh bamboo. I agree. It smells rather good, actually. So what kind of clue can we get from these pieces of giant panda feces, since now we are on a trip of discovery of the giant pandas? Now you can still find some fibers of the bamboo from the feces of the giant panda. We can also tell the size of the animal of the giant panda from our reading of its feces. Already we can tell that these pieces of feces comes from an adult giant panda, but it's not a very old one. From the feces, we can also tell the direction and position of the animal. So we can search the surrounding area in order to find our giant panda today. China has attached great importance to the protection of biodiversity. In old days, we have suffered from the loss of vegetation, forests, and a lot of other natural habitats. But we are now correcting the situation. For example, in the Qingling Natural Reserve, we have succeeded in the protection of this whole natural space so that we can continue to harbor the living of the giant panda. Did you see that? Yes. We try to move closer a little by little. And it's moving. Can you recognize the name of this giant panda? Does he know you? Can you 
Could we continue to follow him while he while he run away? So we try to catch up with the giant panda. We can choose to follow his footprints. Can we trace all the giant pandas? Not. In all the cases, but this time we can do it because we have started our interaction with this one since its childhood. So he's rather familiar with us. That's why we can trace him. Are you doing okay? Yes. As you can see that our friends on site, they're making an effort in tracing this giant panda. You also have to mind their steps because it's quite slippery on the mountains. And they are using the nickname Kitten to call out our giant panda, the one that they are looking for. And this is a male. We can get close, but still we have to keep some social distancing with this giant panda. This one is quite typical. And this one was born in 2005, and I believe that among all the wild giant pandas in the world, this is the only one that would allow human approaching, because since its childhood, we have already started very close relationships with him, and we have also made a lot of interactions with him. It's also one legendary giant panda. Years ago, we have also followed that mating season of the giant panda. And this one has been very active during the mating season. So I believe this one has also reproduced a lot of offsprings. So now he has at least five offsprings. So this one, born in 2005, now he's 17 years old. Usually for a wild giant panda, one can live up to more than 20 years old. So since he's now 17 years old, it's already relatively old. Uh, 
And now we can see that he has relatively bad teeth conditions. However, judging by his color of the fur and also his body conditions, we can see the health condition is rather good with this one. Can we also see other wild giant pandas? Here inside our Qingli Natural Reserve area, we have a bigger chance to see one giant panda living in the wild. <laughs> So this is a very special one. What about the other giant pandas? Could you please give us some explanations about the relatively high ratio of encountering with the giant pandas here. We have very good conditions. And also our workers, they work very hard. They work a lot in the mountains. That's why they can meet very often this wild giant pandas. So for the giant pandas, they can also have a lot of opportunities to run into the human beings. That's why they are not afraid of the human beings. They have already mm. build up the habit to interact with the human beings. They know that we will not hurt him or hurt them. So they feel reassured. Sometimes we can even discover some injured giant pandas at rural households. During the years, the giant pandas, they are very well received by the local residents. And even the villagers, they now have this mentality to better protect our giant pandas. If the giant pandas need help, of course the villagers will come to their rescue and to their help. But for the wild ones, the winter season would be a very huge challenge because it's not very easy for them to discover food in the nature. In 2005, right after its birth, I can very often run into this one in the wild, in the nature. How clever are they? They are very clever, they are very smart. They can also understand our human beings. So that's why just now you call out its nickname, Kitten, Kitten. This is amazing. The giant pandas, they are known all over the world. And this time we can have this opportunity to have a close distance interaction and the opportunity to observe this wild giant panda from very close distance. So let's continue with our walk in the mountains. One important tip for all of you when you go into the nature, when you run into some wild animals, please always keep some distance. Don't try to disturb their normal living. It's also a way to protect yourselves because we always would like to live in harmony with all the natural animals. 
And we share one same planet. So we discovered something. There's a knot. Here are three reasons why we have to tie the red knots on the bamboos. You can always have a guess. You can also leave your answers on our platform. If you get it right or you get all the three right, you can receive a gift from our side. So how long does it take to get to the top of the mountain? Now we are at an altitude of 1,600 meters on the top of the mountain at the peak. It's around 1,900 meters. And later on, when we need to go down the mountains, there is another road waiting for us. So just now, Mr. He has tied another knot with the wall. I'll, now I would like to give the floor to Mr. He to tell us the reasons behind. There are three reasons. First of all, to give the warning. Sometimes when our patrolling team members, they are doing their job here, and they get lost in the mountains. When they see the knot, they know that someone have already discovered the path here, so it's no worry to panic. And the second is to leave a trace of our work here, because sometimes our upper authorities would come to this region to check out the progress of our work. And the third explanation is the warnings to the wrongdoers. This is a sign to show them that our patrolers are around. Please pay attention, don't hurt any animals. And we often use GPS to trace our animals. You can also find the trajectories on the map. But still, we have keep this tradition of this red wall tie, tie knot, and we also tell the story to our younger generation of workers. We share the story with them. How many generations have worked here? It's already to the fourth generation. I belong to the third generation, and Mr. Lee, he belongs to the fourth generation. So we pass down this tradition of the red wood not from one generation to another. It's also a sign of encouragement to the younger people. Please don't forget about the initial dreams and ambitions of all the protecting members. Looks very old-fashioned, but there is also the symbol of spirit inside. And we are also sharing the spirit of animal protection from one generation to another. And Mr. Lee, because you are now among the fourth generation of the protectors, how many years have we worked on this place? For eight years already. So when you are doing the patrolling work in the mountains, when you see the different places tied with the knot, what's your feeling? First of all, I know that some of my predecessors, they have already passed this area at least. For the wrongdoers, they cannot come to this place. Mm -hmm. 
And from time to time, we also change the colors of the walls. So the first is to make the sign. The second is to set up a record for the works. And the third explanation is to chase away the poachers. Thank you very much for our colleagues at the site and also the experts at the site to show us about the giant pandas living in the wild in the Qingling area. We have already selected two lucky stars of today. I'm about to read out your names. Congratulations. And one more thing to share with you for the protection of the giant pandas. If we protect the giant pandas, actually we're also protecting the other animals in the nature. In the biology studies, we have discovered that if we protect the certain species of animals at the same time, we're also offering the support and protection to other related species. And inside the Qingling Natural Reserve area, there are also any anim animals living together with the giant panda. So that's why I've mentioned before, if we protect the giant pandas, then actually we are also protecting the other animals. I'm a nature lover. I have so much ambition for the nature and also the flowers, vegetations, plants, etc. If you would like to gain much more knowledge about biological diversity and to know more about the plants and animals on the seven different continents, please stay tuned. Can always take some notes, and you can also try to remember all those tips of knowledge we share you share with you during this program. Because at the end of our program, there will be other rounds of selections of our lucky stars to win the souvenirs. Just now, we have checked out the treasure of Asia, the giant panda living in the wild. Now let's just move to another continent. Previously, we heard from Sui Wenjing. Now let's continue with our video clip. Which continents do you want to visit the most to see the wild animals? I would like to go to Africa to see the elephants and giraffes. I think it would be very interesting. When you go to the zoo, you can see the animals in the close distance, but I prefer to see the animals living in the wild. Have you ever watched the film The King of the Lions? Yes, days ago, one friend shared with us the music from the film. Tell us about your personal experience to get close to nature. I often went to the forests to take beautiful photos and also when I'm very well dressed in the Han costume. Once when I was in Yunnan, I discovered that the scenery is changing and it's always so beautiful, it's breathtaking, and we can feel totally that charm from the nature. So I did one pose of yoga, and it was highly appreciated by our fans with the Weibo. 
刚才这个斯文静说到了哈，他最喜欢的是非洲。其实我们大多数网友跟他的决定是一样的。Okay, as is mentioned by Madam Sui Wenjing, she would like to visit Africa to see the wild animals, and Africa is also one of the most voted destinations among our viewers for the sightseeing with the animals. And now we are about to bring you. To one natural park located on the continent of Africa. Jambo, jina langu ni peni na karibu. Niko katika mbuga ya wanyama ya Amboseli nchini Kenya. Hi, I'm Peni na karibu. I'm at the Amboseli National Park in Kenya. Amboseli National Park has such a rich history. The name Amboseli comes from the Maasai community. It's the predominant community in this area, and so it has such a huge influence in the park itself. The name Amboseli is a Maasai word that means salty dust. So it describes the soil that you find in the park and actually even around the the park in the area. So it is very fine, loose soil. And it is ashy in color, and a lot of times when there's wind, and you'll see that especially when it's hot, there's wind. You'll you'll see these little dust storms that are commonly known as dust devils in this area. Now, Amboseli is also known for two things. One, it's referred to as the land of giants, and that's because you find over a thousand elephants. In this park, free-ranging elephants. So you get a very good up-close view of these free-range elephants in the park. Like you literally have to stop your vehicle sometimes to just let them pass. In fact, one of the interesting things I picked up as we were coming into Amboseli Park, right at one of the gates, they have a set of rules, the do's and the don'ts as you come in, and one of them is about the speed limit. They say the maximum speed is 40 kilometers per hour, and if you exceed that. You will be flagged down by an elephant. Interesting, right? So that just gives you a picture of just how many of these jumbos there are in Amboseli Park, and that's one of the main attractions of the park. The second attraction is the majestic Mount Kilimanjaro. It crowns the the park. On a very clear day, you will actually be able to see the snow-capped peaks. Beautiful. We've been here for three days now, and we've been fortunate to actually capture the snow-capped peaks in the evening. This has happened mostly in the evening, right about 5 p.m. as the sun is just about to go down, and it actually goes all the way until dusk. So it's a beautiful sight. You actually get a very good view of that. You could have a beautiful picture. Now, Mount Kilimanjaro is actually across the border. It is not in Kenya. It is in Tanzania. Amazingly, though, you actually get the best view of the mountain from the Kenyan side here inside the Amboseli National Park. So that's another huge attraction. So as we take a drive through Amboseli, we're likely to see quite a huge number of animals. It's actually a very dynamic and very unique ecosystem. The park is, itself is very small. It's only 390 square kilometers. But amazingly, it has such a huge array. Of animals, it's a haven of biodiversity. We have over 400 species of birds. How amazing is that? And we have these beautiful birds as well, called flamingos, that emigrated from Lake Nakuru and came to Amboseli just recently. So that is also pulling in lots of tourists who cannot perhaps make it to the other side of Kenya, and they come here to Amboseli and they get to see these fantastic birds. So we'll be able to see that. We'll be able to see lots of animals from the Lion King. Most of us have watched that movie. Uh, so we have the elephants, we have the lions. You remember this, the Simba, Nala, and so many others. The hyenas. Remember the character Shenzi. We're likely to see all of these animals. And the beauty of Amboseli is. It's open plains, so it's very easy to spot them from a distance. Let's take a drive and see. Wow, you can do. I want to go. 刚才主持人说到，这里没有那么多非洲象啊。其实非洲象是。I really would like to be there in person. As is mentioned by our host, African elephants. They are even bigger in size than the Asian elephants. 
两种非洲象，一种叫热带草原象，另外一种叫呃森林象。那热带草原象其实。怎么区分这两种象？其实很简单的，热带草原象它的这个大小啊、哦、是弯的，就有一个弧度。那森林森林象是这个牙是直直的，就是戳下去。所以这个其实是非常非常直观的，呃，区分草原象、热带草原象和森林象的这个呃区别很特点。然后还有一个 ，and for the、um, 大象的孕期呀。Forest elephants, they have very straight elephant's tusk. And another interesting fact about the elephants is that for a female elephant, the pregnancy period is very long, 22 months. For human being, we say it's ten months. However, for the、uh, elephants, it's more than twice longer. If you know more about the knowledge concerning the elephants or the other animals on this continent of Africa, you can always share it with all of us on the platform. And also, we are looking at the giraffes. 呃，这种长颈鹿怎么区分？怎么区分呢？其实也是特别直观，特别好区分。And how can we tell the difference from the male and female giraffes? For the females, they have a lot of furs on top of their head. And for the one that we have just watched, this one without the fur on the head, that is a male one. 这个应该是金钱豹，看它的体型很像金钱豹。Looks like a leopard. And the leopards, they are very often seen on the continent of Africa. It's quite an array of animals to be experienced at Ambusteli National Park, and the beauty about this park is that you don't really have to struggle to see the animals. You could just be taking a drive on the road, and boom, there they are. Like now, for instance, look at this old buffalo male just lying here next to the road in this marshy area. So one of the things about such bulls is that they tend to be chased away from the herd. Sometimes it's because they can't even keep up with the pace of the rest of the herd, and so you find they slow down and eventually they're left alone. And you can tell its age by the horns. If you look at it, you find they're long; they've curved all the way up、uh, because they grow with time. It tells you that it's actually lived its years. But looking across the road on the other side. If you can see, there's a huge herd of buffaloes. So most likely, this old mill was in that herd. It could be any other herd. But when you find a herd like that, it's a mix of cows and those are female buffaloes, and young ones and young adults. But when you find a lone mill like the one we've just shown you, that's a very dangerous animal because most times they're angry. They're always angry and ready to attack. But when they are in such a herd, for them, it's security. Because when they are attacked by lions, then they're able to fight back. But the beauty about Amboseli, like I said, the elephants—they're really everywhere. I mean, just look at this spectacular view. They're in this marsh. They're feeding, and you know, elephants are heavy feeders. Let's get more from Mr. Samuel Atambo. He's a ranger here at Amboseli National Park. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So we know that you get to know, I think, all the elephants individually here in Amboseli. Yeah. Um, and we've heard a lot about、uh, elephants, such as Echo,、yeah. but we also know there was another celebrity recently.、Yeah. Talk to us about him. Tell us his name and why that elephant was so famous. Oh, the name,、uh, the name of the elephant was Tim.、Mm -hmm. Actually, those were one of the huge bulls we had,、uh, we have ever had here. So, and、uh, actually, it was, it had a very massive、uh, tusks, which would touch even the ground. And you know, if you could lead the other bulls, there's a group of six. They can move from the park, then they go outside, and they go and feed on、uh, the plants on the other side, and also destroy the vegetation 
and the crops for the villagers which surrounds the park here. And also team used to be very famous because it can destroy the electric fence. Mm. It had that knowledge without even being hurt. So it was very experienced bull here and it was a dominant male. I've heard that his tusks literally touched the ground. Yeah. Is that true? Very true, very true. Wow. Yeah. So that is what made him so unique. Yeah, because of the genes, you know, some of the elephants, the, the genes is like for the human beings, you get some has long teeth, some have short teeth. So mm -hmm. for the team, they used to be very massive and they, they used to touch even the ground. Okay. Yeah. Um, so elephants can live up to how many years? Um, they can live up to 70 years. Wow. Like now team lived up to, I think, almost 70 years. Really? But he died on 2020. Yeah. And he died of, uh, was it an injury or just natural causes? It's a natural cause because old age. old age. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, very true. Okay. Yeah. Now talk to us a little bit about some of the characteristics of elephants. For instance, we've noticed that everywhere where there's a bit of water, we find them or trees. Yeah. Talk to us about why they're so popular in these areas. Actually, they're popular in this area because you can see here there's plenty of food. There's a lot of water here. So that's the reason why they are eating here. You can see this is the place where you can see green grass, green vegetation, and the area is cool for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about the white birds? Because they're everywhere. Where you see an elephant or even a buffalo, you find the, the white birds. What are they called yeah. and what purpose do they serve? Oh, actually, for those ones, those are the, they are called the cattle egrets. Actually, they follow these big mammals because when they are moving, the grass, the grasshopper can be can you can see, can see the grasshopper very easily, and also it can pick some ticks from that those animals. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah. And of course, they don't harm the animals. If anything, when yeah. they're removing the ticks, they're helping clean themselves. It's very true. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a sound I noticed the elephants were making. Yeah. Um, a low rumbling sound. Very true. What does that sound signify? Actually, they are communicating. You know, they can vibrate. They can communicate up to ten kilometers radius. So that's the reason why you hear the, the sound. So they are communicating, maybe they are seeing danger or they want to move to the other end, okay? That's the reason why they normally communicate a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, another thing I've noticed about the elephants is you find a large one at the front, you'll find like a large one at the back and there's yeah. always this little young one somewhere clustered in the middle. Yeah. Uh, that kind of pattern, is it to protect the young ones or is it coincidental? Yeah, no, actually it's to protect the, the young ones when they sense danger. Actually when they're moving, they move in a single file and they norm normally the, the calves they in, the, in the middle for their safety. So for the elephant like this, the big herd, you get the, the one which is experienced, known as the matriarch. It's the one which guides this family when they go and eat food, when they move from the marsh to the, to the other end. So actually, the, the old one is the one which is experienced. Mm -hmm. So it's the one which guides this other family to places where they want to move to. Okay. Yeah. Right. So when we talk about elephants, you know, they're huge, huge, huge mammals. The other animal that comes to mind, especially for people who've watched the movie Lion King, are the lions, the king of the jungle. Yeah. Um, you know, for movie lovers, they will remember uh, Simba, Nala. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about lions and them being the king of the jungle, yeah. And an elephant being the largest land mammal. Yeah. Is it often that you find elephants uh, being attacked by lions, for instance? Yeah, elephants they can be attacked by lions. Mm -hmm. But these lions, they have to be many in number. Yes. The pride of like 10 yes. and the strong ones. That's when they can bring down the elephant. But mostly they go for their cubs, the small ones. Okay. Yeah. All right. But it's not easy for them. Yes. Because elephants actually know how to defend their young ones. Okay. And their experience. Uh huh. Yeah. And and you know the impression you get from a lion, Simba, being the king of the jungle, yeah. is that he can literally get any animal that he wants. Yeah, uh, is that always the case? Talk to us a little a little bit about how they hunt the animals they prefer and why. Actually, for the lions, like now here in Amboseli, they normally hunt the zebras and the wild beasts. Actually, these are easy catch for them. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're plenty, they're many, the grazers. But sometimes they can go for big kill. You know, the pride goes and they, it can bring down a big elephant like this one. Then they can eat it for some time, mm -hmm. right? And they can find that kill until they finish it completely. Okay. Yeah. And um, in, in the movie Lion King, 
Nala, she was this this very strong character. She was the the wife, you know, of of Simba, and I think she played a, a very important role in just helping him conquer his uh, his enemies. And I think that brings me back to the lionesses because they are the ones that hunt. It's not the, the lions that hunt. So the lionesses, how do they hunt? Why are they so central in a pride? Actually, for the family of uh, lions. The dominant female, the one which guides the family, went to hunt. Okay, so normally for the lions, the female is the one which hunts very accurately and they're very fast actually. For the big males, actually after the lioness, they have killed an animal, the male will come and feed first, then the lioness will feed later and the calves also. Mm -hmm. So actually, that's the reason why you see the, 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 the mother of, the, of, of that pride is very caring and he knows when to look for food. So like human beings. Yes, yeah. the mother, the, the, the peel of the community. Okay, yeah. and finally, the hyenas. Uh, we've seen quite a number of them here at Amboseli National Park. Very uh, opportunistic animals sometimes. They wait for the lions to make a kill mm -hmm. and then they go for, for that kill, especially if it's just the lionesses. Yeah. Um, a lot of people refer to hyenas as foolish. Yeah. In fact, I remember in that Lion King movie, yeah. There was this character called Shenzi. In Kiswahili, it means a fool, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, but are hyenas really foolish animals? No, 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 <laughs> they're not foolish animals. Actually, animals like uh, even hyenas, they can kill a live animal like a zebra, like buffalo. You know, when they move together like a, a group, they can uh, attack a big animal and they can bring it down and they can just consume it completely. Mm -hmm. But I think it's not fool because uh, they have their hierarchy also, and they're good hunters, yeah? But they're opportunistic also. And you know, for the, life, for the hyenas, they're the one who cleans our park. After the leftovers have been left, they go and eat those leftovers. So they, they play a, a key role in cleaning our park here. And that is why there's no foul smell very true. in the park, yeah. despite the many kills that happen. Thank you very much, Mr. Tambo, for yes. shedding light on all of these animal characters. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. I think the biggest takeaway for me, uh, these few days I have spent here at the Amboseli National Park, is just how important preservation and conservation of wildlife really is. Amboseli is known for having huge, huge elephants with massive tasks, as you've heard from the ranger Atambo team, who just recently passed away of old age, lived to a ripe old age, had tasks that literally would touch the ground. And you don't really get to see that a lot. And the reason why Amboseli has such a success story when it comes to preservation and conservation of elephants is because it started way, way back, centuries back, because this area, as I mentioned earlier, is predominantly a Maasai area. And the Maasai are known for having fierce warriors. And so back in the day, they had a reputation for being so fiercely protective of these animals that poachers actually never made it to come and poach any animals. And so that reputation was carried on down centuries. And you can see that is how Amboseli has managed to conserve these uh, gentle giants. For me, I guess we wouldn't be talking about elephants if we didn't have such people that were so committed to protecting their heritage. And I guess that is important to pass down these unique lessons and these unique, beautiful pictures, you know, and experiences of these animals down to other generations to come. My thoughts, looking at these beautiful animals, enjoying this beautiful diversity here, you know, I think this is one of the takeaways for me after this whole visit here at the Amboseli National Park. And just now, as is mentioned by our African host, there's one hyena called Shinzi. In Swahili, it means doll person. And also Simba, the hero of our the Lion King in Swahili, it means someone strong or the king. So that is why he is the king of the jungle. And many other interesting animals from the film, 
They can be found in the natural reserves, like zazu, kind of bird, in the northern part of the region. If we can finally put the COVID-19 pandemic to an end, and we have to rush to the continents around the world, and together we can enjoy the beautiful days with them. Just now, we have talked so much about the animals, but we should not ignore the important role played by the plants, vegetation, etc. Now I'd like to give our floor to our host in Europe, and our colleague will show you the Royal Botanical Garden in the UK. It's one of the most well-known botanic park in the whole world. But it might surprise you to know that this particular one is right here in London. I'm Robin Dwyer and I'm in Kew Gardens, which is 132 acres, roughly 53,000 square meters of plants all helping save our biodiversity and keep these wonderful plants for generations to come. So I'm here in the Palm House in Kew Gardens and that's designed to mimic a rainforest environment. So it's always above 18 degrees centigrade because the plants that live here need to be warm and wet. As you can probably hear, there's uh, some lot of watering going on here to keep these jungle style plants well watered. So there's many things that you can see, uh, hundreds 10,000, I think, are specimens of plant here. Uh, they're ranging from uh, things like the ancient cycads, which preceded the dinosaurs. And then in this section here, I don't know if you can see, there is uh, some edible plants. There's a cacao plant here. That obviously goes to make chocolate. We have a vanilla plant up here. And round the corner, we have more edible plants that you might recognize. There is a uh, papaya plant. I'm gonna see if I can take a shot of that right up high. I'm pretty small, so you might not see it above my shoulder, but I will uh, find it. There it is, right behind me, up there. And there are also uh, banana plants. We've got bamboo in here. And it's a fantastic repository of many, many plant species, all helping conserve the biodiversity of our planet. This beautiful pink flower is called the Madagascar periwinkle. It's native to Madagascar, and they found out that it can be used to make drugs that can help treat cancer. Well, this bamboo can grow up to 25 meters in the wild, but uh, not in this greenhouse. So we are here in another wonderful space in Kew Gardens. This is the temperate house. Everything in here has to be kept above 10 degrees centigrade and everything that lives in here would naturally live in the wild in places that are not too hot, not too cold, not too dry and not too wet. So there are around 1500 species in here of all kinds, lots of palms, ferns and beautiful flowers. So we are here with Ema Niklua, who is a research leader in conservation here at Kew. Ema, what is biodiversity? It's a bit of a basic question, but what does it really mean? Biodiversity means the, the sum of all living things, and we tend to talk about it at different levels. So we think about ecosystems, species, and genetic diversity as the three main components of biodiversity. And why is it at risk? What are the biggest risks to our biodiversity? The biggest risks to our biodiversity right now um, are uh, habitat loss, so loss of our natural ecosystems and vegetation, and coming fast up climate change. So while climate change is slightly in the future in terms of its peak risk, it's the evidence of climate change affecting biodiversity is already with us. So the leaves on this plant look very much like a banana and this one is known as a false banana because it's not actually the yellow fruit that's eaten. It's the base and the underground part. It's a very important food crop in southern Ethiopia and they're hoping to do some research on it and make it a valid source of food for the larger African continent. So Q's trying to help. What's Q yeah. doing? We're trying to help um, at the level of making sure that the decisions that are made about what to do about biodiversity are based on strong science. Uh, so that's the sort of the basics of Q. But then increasingly, we're also trying to do the, the influencing around all that. So Q has a, a very wide spectrum of operation. So education and conservation together. 
So it's really important then to find these plants mm -hmm. and if they're at risk, mm -hmm. become aware of that and put them on, put them we, on the red list. What does that yeah. mean? What happens then? Okay, so if, if we make an evaluation, um, we put, put the plant on the red list. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's threatened. Everything that we evaluate properly gets on the red list. But the threatened part of the red list um, has plants that are vulnerable, endangered or critically endangered. And Q's working in cooperation with China in some ways. Yes, in, in numerous ways, but um, specifically of relevance, um, I guess you'll be at the COP perhaps in Kunming, and uh, Q has a partnership with the seed bank there. Now we should be looking at a plant here, but unfortunately there's only an empty pot. It's a memorial, if you like, to the St Helena olive, a plant which Q tried its hardest to save, but actually sadly went extinct in 2003. But they did manage to save its DNA, which they're going to use for research, and maybe one day, if conditions are right, bring it back. So we've come outside now in Kew Gardens and we're in the Mediterranean garden which has been designed to mimic the kind of plants and flowers you would see in parts of southern Europe, so Italy, France, Spain, Greece and so on. The weather today is a bit like that here, although it isn't usually in London. So the kind of things we're looking at are, I've seen some lavender, there's some sweet smelling rosemary, lots of beautiful flowers and things like olive trees which give a real Mediterranean vibe. Well, I've only been able to show you just a fraction of the things there are to see here at Kew Gardens in London. It really is no wonder it's one of the UK's top tourist attractions, but it is just so much more than that. It has a really important role in helping keep our biodiversity for the future. Just now we have talked about St. Helena olive. It has already gone extinct. Every time when we mention those extinct vegetation, the plant or animals, that is a sign of warning to our human beings. If we don't do anything, if we don't work harder to protect those animals and plants, then more animals and more plants would be put in this risky situation. I've been to the UK, but I've not been to the Kew Gardens in person. I hope in the future that I could get a chance to visit that garden myself. And for a lot of those wonderful places, without COVID-19, I think it's quite easy for us to go and visit. But if we talk about the seven continents, then for the Antarctica, that would not be a place that is so easy to visit. Currently, we have already set up the reserve area around the Antarctica, especially for the protection of the biodiversity. Today, we have invited several guests who are very familiar with Antarctica. For example, one researcher, Miao Xing, and he has visited this place for five times in a period of one decade. Hello, everyone. My name is Miao Xing. I'm from the Research Institute of Oceanography, Ministry of Natural Resources. What's the last visit to Antarctica? I have accomplished the 38th research mission for the Antarctica. We've been back on the 22nd of April. Could you please share with us the details about the missions over the past one decade for the seal study and also for the penguins. And we also had other missions, for example, for the base creatures. So over there, you can have the opportunity to see the seals and other wonderful creatures. Yes, very often. And for the walrus, walrus, you cannot find them in the Antarctica. You can only find them in the North Pole. For the seals and also the walrus, we don't have so much opportunity to see them in person. But I've discovered one way to tell the difference from the walrus and the seals. 
For the warriors, they cannot stand straight. But for the seals, they look alike the warriors. However, they can stand straight. Right on the surface of the rice. For the walrus, they also have very long teeth. Is that right? I think it's right. One more thing. For the sea lions, you can find the part on the head looks like an ear, but it's very soft one. And today we're also talking about different subspecies of the sea lions and walrus. In Antarctica, we can find normally seas, common species of the seals and sea lions. This is called the welder seal. It's commonly seen around the Antarctica. Usually they have the smaller size of the head and longer body size. And they're very mild in character. It's relatively easy for us to get closer to them. And for this species, they are also more oftenly attacked by the whales, for example. And for the younger children of this subspecies of the welder seals, they can be captured and killed by the other subspecies of the seals. What about these two? This is mom and son. They want to climb out from the water. The mother has, first of all, carved away, and the mother has let the son to go first. They're making this hole, and from some from time to time, they have to get out of the water for the respiration. In Antarctica, usually, we can only see this welder seals that are making the holes on this thick surface of the ice. They have very developed muscles around the neck area. And they will come out for breathing and for how much time they can stay in water. They can stay every time for several dozens of minutes. Maximum duration can be uh, 70 minutes or more. And usually they will stay there for more than a dozen of minutes. And they will also do this in a fixed area of ice. We have the fast ice and the pack ice. For example, we have the floating pieces of ice that can be movable floating on the water, and there are also relatively fixated parts that are connected with the land. Uh, 
。那最早先是由欧洲的这些博物学家拿到这种海豹的骨骼以后。This is another subspecies of the seal. In the early days of the discovery of the species, the scientists thought, according to the shape of their teeth, it's very suitable for the eating of the crabs. So we call them crab-eating seals. However, later we discovered that they are not feeding on the crabs. Instead, they prefer the shrimps. But we keep that beautiful mistake. What about the size of the body? They are relatively slim compared to the other subspecies. And they can move very fast on the surface of the eyes. They can do a zigzag movement like the snakes, and they can also slide forward. What about this guy? Is that you? No, it's one colleague from Russia. He's one of the close friends of mine, and I. Each time when I do the field research, I will be accompanied by this Russian friend. You can find a lot of、uh, foreign stations of researchers. You can make new friends here, and together we can have some work. <laughs> So from the video clip, we can also see the extreme weather conditions. For example, here the seals they are moving down into the water. In an extreme weather, will they be hiding within the water? Yes, when there is the storm of ice, for example. The snow and ice storm, when it hits, usually the temperature inside the water would be even hotter. For the seals, they are also very prudent. First of all, they will just dip their head into the water to test it out to see whether temperature is good. Then, if they make sure that it's very okay with the temperature of the water, then they will get the whole body inside the water. Imagine that there is the heavy storm here. And you are standing on ice. How you can get yourself protected? Usually, when we go out into wildness, we will read the forecast of the weather. We have done our homework in the first place. And when there is the attack of a sudden storm, we will immediately retreat. And when we were doing the video shooting, actually, we were standing not very far from. A foreign station of observation. So I was in a very safe conditions. So people are very friendly towards each other among different nationalities. So what about this creature? It's a baby sea lion. <laughs> Looks like a puppy instead of a baby sea lion. He's playing with you. I discovered this one in January 2013. Doing one random visit, and later on,、um, I've carried out regular observation on this lovely creature. I will move to the area of his birth. As I can tell, that he's moving around alone. Does he belong to a group? Actually, this area is not the area for reproduction of their species. So, 
In another place, we can find millions of Antarctica sea lions. The mothers will get together to give birth to babies. And in this Gulf region, this is the only one that I've discovered. I think he's looking for something. He's waiting for his mother to come back. So his mother every day would go out. Not every day. Every time his mother would leave for three to five days. And then after a three to five day long visit, the mother would come back to nurture, to milk the sea lion. What about that period for the mother sea lion to leave? If something happens to her, what about the baby? Who can take care of the baby? then possibly this baby sea lion would be adopted by another female sea lion. So you have been constantly observing this one. I've made the recording until end of March. So that's about a duration of two months of observation. So later on, after the end of March, you didn't see the sea lion anymore. I've searched around in this area and also the neighboring area, the neighboring Gulf. After end of March, I didn't see this one anymore. And I didn't know where he went. In the future, we can consider some missions of the observation of those sea lions. For example, we can consider the real-time observation and tracing of the sea lions. Thank you very much, Mr. Miao. Thank you for sharing us um, your wonderful adventures in the Antarctica. I also wish you successful missions in the future so that you can contribute more wisdom of your side and I hope to join you in the studio in the future. So it's so funny, the penguin. For those who have followed our previous programs about China, you must be very familiar with our upcoming guest. One of our old friends, Dodo. Hello, everyone. I'm Dodo. Just now, with the ending of the previous video, we have noticed that the lovely penguin has just attacked the tail of the seals. Yes, in a certain area, all the creatures that live in harmony, but sometimes there could also be conflicts and attacks. 
For a certain species of the Antarctica seals, they will feed on the penguins. They will eat them. For this uh, specific species of the seals, they will feed on the penguins. They have the dotted patterns on the skin. We have prepared some photos. This is one penguin that has just escaped from the attack. However, he has been so gravely attacked and injured, finally he didn't survive. So when you make the shot, when you make the photo, have you ever considered the possibility of saving the penguin? I believe that in the nature we have to follow and respect the rule of the nature. We should not do too much intervention in the nature. Even when the animals, they are in danger, they are attacked by the other species. We try to minimize our human interference. Is that you in water? So on the land and in the water is totally different. Lovely footprints. We go to the Antarctica to take photos and videos about the penguins. Could you please share with us some knowledge about or stories about the penguins? For example, these penguins are the male penguins. They have to collect a lot of pebbles on the stones to build up something so that finally they can succeed in attracting the other female penguins. Some male penguins, they are hardworking, and some others, they are very lazy. So, for example, from this video, you can see some of the hard-working males, they have collected a lot of stones, but for the other lazy ones, they were just, just trying to steal the stones from their neighbors. And sometimes the seals will try to steal the eggs or the baby penguins for the penguin side. What about this baby penguin? Is he dead? Actually, he is just taking a break after the meal. He's enjoying his life. At that moment, we thought he's so cute. That's why we made that photo shooting. I know that previously you've also taken a lot of pictures about the whales. Yes, in Antarctica, very often you can also see the whales. So, I want to know that we are 
没有去过南极，我当然这肯定是大多数像您这样的能去南极观察这些。For the majority, for us, we didn't have a chance in the past to visit Antarctica. Only a few got the chance to see that land. For example, you. So we have a lot of questions. How cold is it in Antarctica? What about the changes of the temperature during the day? Do you have a significant difference of temperature? We also have summer and winter in Antarctica. If you go and visit Antarctica in its summer season, it's so acceptable for us. However, if you choose to visit that land, that continent, in winter, then it's really a big challenge for everyone. I've noticed one giant whale in your video. You can also see the sunset. That's a wonderful adventure. And until now, only Phil has this privilege to visit that continent. So I sincerely hope that more people like you, who have already the chance to visit Antarctica, could try to capture that beauty with your words, like the photo and also the videos. And together, we can share the beauty of nature. We are all citizens on this planet. So let's enjoy those beautiful images captured by Dodo. If I were there with you on the boat, there's no words to express my feelings. However, I've already made it into my bucket list to visit Antarctica one day. Imagine if I could go there one day. First of all, I, ha I have to collect on some found, the fundraising, and what about the other preparations? So I thought there were some connection problems. As is mentioned before, I think the Antarctica is a mysterious place. Everyone would like to have a chance to visit a continent. So maybe we can say thank you to Dodo for sharing us her unique experience and a lot of knowledge about this continent. And I know that Dodo, you are also a great expert about the rainforest. So in the future, there will also be other more sessions to tell about to tell everyone about the rainforest. So maybe we will get you inside our live streaming programs in the future. Just now we have checked out 
the animals in the Antarctica. We have also visited the other continents, for example, with the savanna and also the botanical gardens. And now we'd like to move to North America. When we talk about the natural parks and reserves, of course we will think of the Yellowstone. So I'd like to give the floor to Mark Neal, a CGTN reporter, to see where he would bring us to. I can't wait to show and tell you all about. But first, I want you to get a glimpse of the beautiful scenery that I am seeing right now. Some very majestic trees that you just caught a glimpse of right there. I'm going to tell you much more, but first I want you to actually guess where I am. Is it A, Yosemite, B, Sequoia National Park, or C, Joshua Tree? Have a think about it and put your guess yes. in the comment zone section. But I'm also going to give you a little hint or perhaps a really big hint. This is the park's main attraction. It's called the General Sherman. The General Sherman is the biggest tree in the world. It's not the tallest, it's not the widest, but it is the biggest tree in the world based on the volume of its trunk. A few other tree trunks are bigger, some trees are taller, but no other tree has more wood in its trunk than the Sherman tree. The Sherman tree's top is dead, so the tree trunk no longer gets taller. However, its volume keeps increasing. Each year, the trunk grows wider, adding enough wood to equal another good-sized tree. So it's not the tallest tree in the world, but the General Sherman is pretty darn tall in my book. How tall do you think it is? A, 63 meters, B, 73 meters, or C, 83 meters? What do you think? Well, the answer is 83 meters, and that's as tall as a 27-story building, so that is really tall. But unfortunately, we can't get too close because the General Sherman, being so popular, is fenced off. But there are many others that you can get right up next to. I'm going to look. Sequoia National Park's giant forest is home to around 8,000 sequoia trees. Come take a look. In fact, Half of the world's largest and longest trees are in this area. You can learn about them inside and out. Absolutely amazing. In fact, they're so tall, over 200 feet, and yet when you look down at its base, their roots are not deep at all. In fact, they only go about five feet down or 1.5 meters. Uh, that balance <laughs> is a bit out of whack. So the number one cause of death for these trees is actually toppling over which as I say that, that's a little bit scary when I'm inside there right now. I think I'll move outside. Some of the trees here have so much character that they get their own name, like this group of eight trees, which is called the Parker Group, named after former Army Captain James Parker and his family. You can see how majestic they are. In fact, you ever heard the term tree hugging? Well, these trees have been really good to me. Let's give them a hug. And here at the park, there are even trees that you can drive through. That's right, we are here at Tunnel Log. A tree that fell many, many years ago. We don't know how old it was, but now it's a little tunnel where you can go right through. Oh, it says it fell in 1937. Here we go. And to learn more about Sequoia National Park and its many intricacies, I'm meeting up with an expert here. I'm going to meet one of the park's ecologists, Danny Boyano. Nice to meet you, Danny. Hi, Mark. Nice Mark to meet New. you, too. How are you? Um, we're meeting at a special place. This is very, very interesting. Let's take a look over here. What is this? Well, this is a place we call Tharp's Log, and it's named after Hale Tharp, who was in one of the earliest settlers in the in the area. He came here in the 1850s 
and um, created this cabin uh, attached to this down giant sequoia log and uh, was here for a number of years. Let's see what we have in here. And that looks like, <laughs> what is that there? Well, this is the inside of a sequoia log. So giant sequoia, um, you know, uh, Hale uh, fashioned a picnic table here and there's a, a foundation for a bed over there and there's a window and you could see the, the inside of the, the log is uh, black. So that was probably from the, the, the tree burning and falling. And so it was, you know, it wasn't hail that made this black. Probably had fires in here. Fire plays a very important role, but a lot of protection measures that go in here. Yeah, so fire is a natural part of the ecosystem. It's been here for a long time. And, uh, you know, sequoias are actually dependent on fire. The cones that hold their seeds, which is how they reproduce, they only open up and release in large amounts from the heat of a fire. So they actually need fire to both release their seeds and it clears the underbrush on the ground. It clears the soil so the seeds have a place to, to, to germinate and grow into a tree. Can we take a look at some of those cones? Uh, yeah, there's cones all on the ground right here. You know, some right below our feet. So. These are sequoia cones right here. Some, you know, they're not fresh. Uh, they're, you know, a couple of years old or older. If we looked around, we could probably see some fresh ones. They're, they're green when, they're, when they've just fallen and then they, you know, they turn brown as they get older. So here, this is a lot of evidence of a, would you call this a big burn scar? This is a burn scar, yes. Okay. And it's interesting because we'd be worried about them getting burned down in California's wildfires. Yeah. But you also prescribe burns here, right? Yeah, it is a, um, an interesting situation where, as I mentioned before, sequoia, giant sequoia are dependent on the heat from fire to reproduce, but also fire can be destructive towards them, where if the fire burns too hot, if the fire burns really hot and gets up into the crown of the tree, then even huge monarch sequoias can die as well. And in fact, that happened the last two years. In 2021 and 2020, we had two very large fires in this area of, of the Sierra Nevada and um, lots and lots of, of giant sequoias, including large ones, died in the very hot heat of that fire. All right, we spot something over there. What is that right there, Dan? That's a mule deer and it's a native deer in the park and it's a male. You could see the antlers that are starting to grow on it, the fuzzy antlers. So uh, it's the beginning of their growing season for the, for the antlers. And it's browsing on a, a, a ceanothus bush. It's, so they are herbivores, they'll browse different plants. And right now we have a young male browsing on ceanothus. And are these deer pretty uh, peaceful or what would we say? How would you describe them? Yeah, they're very peaceful. They're not, they're not uh, aggressive towards people. The, their most uh, aggressive thing is the males will fight each other uh, when it's breeding season. You know, they actually have a rut where the males will clash heads and they nail their antlers together. And uh, that's the most aggressive thing they do. And just look around me. I'm sort of getting surrounded by some kind of insect. Is it A, a fly? B, a gnat, or C, perhaps ladybugs. Which one is it? I'll give you a second here or two. Well, fortunately, if you can tell from the smile on my face, I'm enjoying them right now because they are indeed C, ladybugs. To be here right now while all of these hundreds and thousands of ladybugs are hatching at the same time and landing on you and you can see them flying around it's pretty darn cool even though when one might walk through here they might not see something uh, they'll definitely hear something in the form of birds singing or in the form of um, rodents um, doing their chirping uh, and if they get lucky they might see an american black bear that's probably the most iconic species that um, walks around here we have a big black bear population and uh, we heard there was one nearby here. We haven't been lucky enough to see it yet. And a lesson to all you nature watchers out there, be patient and good things may happen. Right behind me over there, American black bear. Don't approach, don't leave any food out because it might come after you. We're taught respectfully to be in awe and fear of bears, but as I watch this one play in a meadow, 
it's hard not to think of thoughts of just serenity and wonder. Wondrous fauna and obviously some breathtaking flora right before my eyes here at Sequoia National Park. You can just touch it, smell it, sit right next to it. It really makes you think about the beauty surrounding us and how we as humans are just very small cogs in a massive ecosystem and all responsibility for taking care of it and allowing it to grow and prosper for generations to come. So just now our host has taken us to the Sequoia National Park in the U.S. In China, we also have the plantation of Sequoia, mainly located in the Ming River Basin of the Sichuan Province. Just now, our reporter has closed this video clip with a very giant tree. So I recalled my visit to Banna Prefecture of Yunnan Province. I was then standing in front of a giant tree too. For that big plantation, in order to hug the tree, we need 20 persons. So in front of those giant vegetation, those plantations, you can feel how small we are as human beings. When standing in front of a tree, in front of the ocean, and in front of the universe, you can feel how small we are. And talking about the rainforest, we will immediately think about the Amazon rainforest. And then, 60% of the forest area is located in Brazil. And also for the neighboring countries, they also have their own parts of the uh, rainforest. And now I'm about to show you a natural reserve and national park in Brazil. Inside, you can find a very enriched biodiversity, the trees, flowers, animals and birds, water creatures, etc. We'll show you a video clip. First, we'll take the boat for three hours before reaching this national park. We have our cameraman here. We got up very early in the morning. Uh, there's too much mosquito here, so we didn't sleep very well. I'm now at a port. Just now, according to our worker here, we have to wash our hands. It's very hot here. A lot of people would put some sun cream on their body. However, in order to protect the balloon fish here in the Amazon River, we have to wash the cream off. These are the balloon fish. So we have the river dolphin. Will he bite me? Every day there will be 15 dolphins here. We will feed them with 2,000 grams of meat. 
In their adulthood, they will turn into the pink color, but when they are a little bit younger in the childhood, they are in a grayish color. We feed them, and they leave with a lot of satisfaction. On the top of the head, they also have this breathing hole. When they breathe, they will make sounds like puff. <laughs> Just like that, they are breathing. After three hours of traveling with our boat, we arrive at the Yawu National Park. Two of the workers here will be our guide today. As you can see those branches, they are going inside a boat. We have a very narrow gate into the national park. Now we are in the river of Yawu. Yawu is the name of a common fish in this locale. So we name this park after the fish. Some of the local trees here. Very common fruit in Brazil. You can find ice cream and also the fruit juice based on this fruit. It's very slippery here because we are now in a raining season. And now we are surrounded by the cyber trees. The cyber trees have a total height here of more than 40 meters. According to our guide, for these slice-shaped part of the trunk, you can knock on it and there is the sound coming out. For the local residents who were living inside the park area, if they were attacked by the wild animals or they got lost, they will just use something to hit on the flat section so that they can make huge sounds to send the message to the outside world and people would rush to their rescue. A kind of nut. On our back, we had the luck to see some birds here. They are the macaws. We try to mimic the sound of their calls and they are calling back the macaws. I believe that those are very large macaws. Usually the uh, macaws we can find in the markets or at the household, they are quite limited in size, but those ones that we can see in the Amazon rainforest, they're very huge in size. Now I'd like to show you the mangroves. Hi, I'm Victoria and I'm located in Taparicas Island. 
right now it's actually 28 degrees even though it's autumn so it's pretty much hot throughout most of the year and i want to highlight as well that you know i'm in the northeast of brazil so as a whole the region has a pretty hot climate as well i'm located in the state of bahia as well and there is one thing that i want to emphasize because for the longest time mangroves were regarded as something that it wasn't important it was a wasteland and now it's well known that it's super important because it works with seabeds and it works with coral reefs as a single system so you're gonna see it's very rich and it's very diverse you're gonna see crabs and you're gonna see other sea creatures there are birds here as well so it's pretty much very exciting so come along with me in this journey very impressive about mangroves it's how rich the nature is as you can see there was a bird right behind me and there is a plant right here so even though there is a sea you can see an incredible variety of plants well我其实不瞒大家说啊就是如果我觉得这个小片没有音乐的话我真的觉得它是在拍摄的是一个洪灾过后的灾区虽然虽然这个 so, so I would like to say thank you to our friend on the site to visit that island and also to um, show us around for this forest of mangroves. As is mentioned before, the mangroves, they are long ignored resources. Actually, they play a very important part for the protection of the biodiversity. And they are also showing us this capacity of storage of the carbon dioxide. They are the natural barriers and to help to protect the seabed against the attack of the tides and also the, blood, the flooding. If you ever visited the province of Hainan and Yunnan, then that video clip of Yawu National Park and also the mangrove forests, they would show you similar images of the trees, even though they come from different places, one in South America, one in Asia, in China, you can see the similarities of the vegetation of the plantations. And now, finally, I'd like to move on with our program to show you the Oceani. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruby, and I'm Chris. It's a good day today. We are having a wonderful day and we are also in a beautiful place. Dear viewers, can you have a guess where we are? What are you reading? Do you know these two animals? Those are kangaroos and also the emus. They are unique animals of Australia. Let's go. Actually, you can find a lot of interesting animals in Australia. Why we have decided to put kangaroo and also emu on the national emblem?
你知道考拉一天是二十到二十二个小时吗？你要运气很好才在开到。一天就只有二十四个小时，你在开玩笑吗？ Know the koala that will sleep for more than twenty hours during the day. You're having a wonderful life. I hope this is my life, you know? I hope everyone likes it. Hi, my name is Regina Smith. Um, I have a few questions about the koalas. Yep. So my first is, um, I see that the very cute koala is sleeping. Yeah, <laughs> here we go. Um, how long do they sleep for every day? They sleep for about tw twenty hours a day. They can sleep for a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on the amount of energy in the leaf. But. 20 hours is pretty average, just because there's nothing in the leaf for them to have the energy to, to, to wake up. So they eat, sleep, wake up and eat again. If, they, if the leaf doesn't provide that much energy for them, why do they still eat it? Like, can't they eat something else which gives them more energy? So if they found something else to eat two, four, two three thousand years ago, they probably could. But because this has been all that they've been eating for about two, three, four, three three thousand years, their stomachs have evolved so that they can eat it without being affected by any of the toxins. Which means that if they were to eat something else, then the stomach would have nothing to use those bacteria for, and it would make them sick. So they eat these leaves because they can digest them now, and they can get stuff out of them. There's just not much in it for, for, for them. So they've they've maintained a balance to do it with not much to really balance it with. Is this all they eat, or do they eat any other plants? They can eat some other, some other leaves, but leaves is pretty much all they eat. So the main one they eat, the one that we have here, is eucalyptus. But they can eat certain other species of paper bark and any sort of gum tree, eat like that. Pretty much, pretty much anything in the gum family. But they mainly eat the eucalyptus. That's the main thing we feed them here. And um, what's their average life expectancy? In captivity, these guys will live for about 18, 18 years. In the wild, they only really live to be about ten if they're lucky. Um, for, and, and with the bushfires and the floods, they can live for a, a lot, sh lot shorter time than that too. But here, for here in captivity, they live for about 18, 19 years. All right. Thank you so much. No worries. 很难得呀，他一天要睡二十多个小时。对啊，我记得我小时候每次来的时候，我都困得好像在睡觉。So as we were told, every day they have to sleep for twenty hours or so. When we were young, when we were visiting the zoo, we've never seen a koala awake. Oh, he's detected something. He's discovered something. 爪子怎么？一个手指头有两个。一个手指头有两个爪子，还有个手指头没有爪子。多奇怪！哎，我刚才听到那人说是因为他们爬树需要。哦，因为有爪子，所以它可以保持一个平衡。对，就是那些手那么像人的手，会有指纹吗？嗯，我刚刚观察一下，好像确实有指纹，好像每一个指头上都有。Do they have fingerprints? I think yes. Just like human beings. That is another koala. And according to our worker here, according to the keeper, that one is not that friendly. So maybe that's why he's hiding himself there, behind the leaves. And according to the keeper, we have two male ones here. Do they fight? Actually, they do fight. But what are they fighting for? For a place to sleep? No, actually, they are fighting for food. They're so lovely, the koalas. Over there, I've discovered the kangaroos, so we'll just run to the spot and feed them. This is a baby kangaroo. It's so cute. The kangaroo is my favorite animal. Wow, it's so cute. Look at this kangaroo. Hey, this kangaroo is in his bag. You don't touch his bag. It's to protect his child. 
Just try don't to touch the pocket. Kangaroos will keep their babies in this pocket. We don't see very often the animals with a pocket. What's your favorite um, animal in this park? What's your favorite animal at this park? What's your favorite animal, Lucas? Um, the koalas. The koalas? And why do you like the koalas? Um, because they can climb up trees. What's your favorite animal? Roosters and peacocks. Oh, uh, I'd have to say the koalas are my favourite. And why is that? Uh, they play an important part in Australia's ecology and because they were endangered in the bushfires two years ago, I think the park does a lot of work to try and you know, rehabilitate them. So we're really happy because they're a national animal that they have a long, happy life here. Yeah. An um, international um, day for biological diversity is coming up. What would you like to show you the wild animals? <gasps> would you like to say we'll look after you and keep you safe? Thank that you. sounds good. <laughs> Um, I hope they have long and healthy, happy lives and I think we as humans need to respect them and do a lot more work to ensure their survival for our future generation like these guys. Thank you so much. No problem. Hey, you haven't seen the animal in the world? Yes, I heard the animal is the most fast animal in the world. And that is an emu. That is one of the birds that is fast running. Still, you didn't tell me why we have selected those two animals, kangaroo and also the emu, to be presented on the ambulance, national ambulance. Those are the two only animals in Australia that can only move forward and never step back. So it's also a symbol of courage. And today we have visited so many animals, they are very cute. Which one is your favorite? I think it's kangaroo, especially for that baby one. Harbored in the pocket of the mother kangaroo. And also the koalas sleeping on the branches of the trees and also the emus with their long legs, they're all very cute. I hope that they can find a very good habitat so they can find enough food to eat and also water to drink. Sincerely, we hope that all the animals living on this planet can be very well protected. And we also hope that we can discover more interesting animals in the future. After visiting the park of Kaola in Australia, and now we are concluding our trip on the seven continents. I hope that you've enjoyed all this trip. In the very beginning, I've told all of you that you have to pay attention to the knowledge that we share during this program because towards the end of this live streaming program, we will give you some questions. It's like a short quiz. If you get the answers right, you can receive a gift. Now, my question is, how high is that Sherman, General Sherman Sequoia in the Sequoia National Park? If you know the answer, then you can just leave a message on our platform. So two lucky stars got the answer right. I just read out your names. For this year's International Day for Biological Diversity, we say that we would like to build up a shared future for all the animals living on this planet. Earth 
this planet belongs to the previous generations of life and also to the future generation and also to this current living generation. Our most mission is to better conserve the planet and also to protect the ecosystem, biodiversity. Let's join our hands and start from right now. So that's all for today's special program for the International Day for Biodiversity. Coming up, there will be two special programs, lovely neighbors and also the other cute creatures. So thank you very much for staying with me for two hours. See you next time.